one of the ways in which less powerful people are badly treated, and it's not a way we always think about, is they are not given sound alternative ways of making sense of their experience. They are told you have bipolar disorder or you have a personality disorder. And if you try to object, you quickly find where the power lies. So I'm going to start by filling in a little bit of background about um, some ideas which are quite popular in the UK, which I think you're probably familiar with. Some of you will be familiar with them anyway in uh, Denmark, but because these ideas fed into the framework. So it's a bit of the background to the framework, if you like. The framework is a very ambitious attempt to replace or suggest a replacement for the diagnostic model, the medical model of mental distress, the idea that people are suffering from illnesses that need diagnosing. But it builds on ideas that are already around in the UK. But there is something in the UK called formulation. Is that a familiar word to some of you? Some of you are nodding. Good. I'm going to show you an example, an invented example of a formulation in a minute. In essence, a formulation is like a kind of personal story about the reason that someone may be experiencing distress. So it can be a couple of paragraphs. It can be a diagram. It's widely used in the UK and all clinical psychologists in the UK are trained in formulation and every clinical psychologist in the UK would say my practice is based on formulation. I don't know if that's true in Denmark. Uh, we have a set of professional guidelines which you can download for free which is about the research into formulation, what's the best way of doing it, what are the advantages, how can we do it in a way that's thoughtful and sensitive and helpful, how can we avoid it perhaps being unhelpful, and so on. So those are free to read. Uh, this is a book that I was a co-author with about the many uses of formulation in different settings and with different kinds of problem and within different therapies because every different therapeutic approach has a slightly different version of formulation, CBT or psychodynamic or whatever. So that's if you want to read further. I'll show you an invented example in a minute. But in essence, as I said, a formulation is a personal narrative which integrates, pulls together two equally important forms of evidence. The clinician, the therapist brings their theory, research and clinical experience. The client brings their knowledge of their life history and what's happened to them and what it meant to them. And if you put these things together, you can develop a hypothesis, a theory in, or simpler language, a best guess. What do we think's going on here that's led to you becoming dis distressed? And once we've got that personal theory, if you like, we can think about, well, what might help? So it's a guide to what to do next. And I like this phrase, a process of ongoing collaborative sense making. So we're thinking together all the time, what makes sense? Does this seem to make sense? Does that seem to make sense? And in the UK, we also have quite widely used another, a version of formulation, which is called team formulation, which means a whole team gets together and somebody, usually a psychologist, runs the meeting and the team thinks together about what do we think is going on with this person we're working with? How can we get a shared, agreed idea about what's going on here? So ideally, a formulation is not based on a diagnosis. It's based on the personal story and what's gone on in their lives. So formulation is widely used in the UK. Most services probably have some sort of team formulation practice. And also the UK, we are starting to take on board the trauma-informed approach. Are you, some of you will be familiar with this. Yeah, it comes from America. Mainly it's, it's uh, used widely in New Zealand and Australia and Canada. In the UK, we are starting to take it on board. Those are two very important books if you want to read further. That's an Australian organisation and an American website which summarises some of the research underpinning this approach, which is about the adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, the ACEs research, if you haven't come across that, it's well worth reading. So I'm going to give you the briefest, briefest possible summary of what we mean by trauma-informed approach, but if you're interested, you would need to find out more about it. So no need to read all these words, but by trauma, we mean a whole range of things. We don't just mean things like sexual abuse. We mean neglect, physical abuse, psychological abuse, domestic violence and the various forms of sexual abuse. And a lot of the trauma-informed approaches also look at wider factors like 
the whole environments people live in, if they live in violent neighbourhoods or if they live in very unequal, unjust settings or if they're constantly facing racial discrimination, for example. So what the research shows is that all of these factors make it much more likely you'll experience mental distress of various types and a whole lot of other things like physical ill health and not doing very well at school and all the rest of it. It's kind of common sense in a way. I mean, anyone who works in services knows that. But it, what it's important to do is to have research that backs it up. OK, so this research really backs up the idea. As the saying goes, it's not what's wrong with me, it's what's happened to me. Yeah, what happened to me led to my distress. This is a very simple way of putting it together. A kind of vicious circle, a circle that carries on getting worse and worse sometimes. So you might start with deprived communities, but of course anyone can experience traumas. You might have parents who've got their own difficulties that they haven't had help with. They might then be less able to look after their own children in the best way. Those children will then be set up to deal less well with other things that happen to them because they haven't had a good start in life. We have all, as human beings, evolved. We have bodies that will respond, minds and bodies that will respond automatically to certain forms of stress. So are you familiar with the fight, flight, freeze? Yeah, so we all have those kind of threat responses. Uh, dissociation is one. That means cutting off from the memories and feelings of very distressing events. We can actually encode or remember memories in different parts of our brains if they're very distressing. So we may not consciously remember them, but they're still there somewhere. We then may feel betrayed, distrustful and so on. We then go on to try to create safety, to cope with our feelings, to escape from pain, to forget memories. And the ways we do this may include flashbacks, self-harm, <coughs> controlling our eating, using drugs and alcohol. So in mental health systems, these are usually called symptoms, but in a trauma-informed approach, they are called threat responses. They are there for a good reason. They helped us to survive. They are threat responses or survival responses. So they're things to be grateful for in a way. How lucky we were able to do that because it kind of kept us going. But of course, in the long term, threat responses can be a problem. Sometimes we need help to move on from threat responses. This is, I think, a very powerful approach because it includes what goes on in our bodies, but not in a medical model way, not in a it's the low levels of serotonin causing your depression way, including how our bodies are part of all our experience. And there's a lot of evidence to support it. And it very clearly says that services may actually not only help, but may make people worse. Services can re-traumatise people. And of course, we don't intend to do that, but that can often happen. Does that, does that kind of make sense? A very, very brief summary. So... Services in the UK are slowly starting to think in trauma-informed terms, very slowly, I would say. To sum summarise, um, what I've been arguing for for a long time, as well as a lot of other people, including the people who've talked here, is for a formulation-based trauma-informed approach. You put both those things together, so it's about listening to the stories of people's traumas and adversities. So what that means is we see ourselves as we're dealing with people with problems, not patients with illnesses. Yeah. Symptoms are actually survival strategies. They helped us to survive, but perhaps they become a problem in the long term. Instead of asking what's wrong with you, we need to ask what's happened to you. Instead of diagnosing people, we need to listen to their stories. The alternative to diagnosis is listening to people's stories. The alternative to the medical model, or one alternative, is the trauma-informed approach. Every formulation, every personal story, really has the message, what you're going through is a normal reaction to abnormal circumstances. Anyone else who'd been through the same might end up reacting in the same way. So I'm going to show you an invented example of what I would call a trauma-informed formulation.
and they're going to ask you to imagine that someone who might otherwise get a diagnosis of schizophrenia had the chance to sit down over a period of possibly quite a long time, possibly months, with someone who was really going to listen to their story and that they were able to put together a joint and agreed version, a shared story, a formulation in, which is what we'd call it in the UK, a formulation. So as I say, I've invented this, but it could look something like this. You had a happy childhood until your father died when you were aged eight. As a child, you felt very responsible for your mother's happiness and you pushed your own grief away. Later, your mother remarried and when your stepfather started to abuse you, you did not feel able to confide in anyone. You left home as soon as you could and got a job in a shop. However, you found it very hard to deal with your boss whose bullying reminded you of your stepfather. One day you started to hear a male voice telling you that you were dirty and evil. This seemed to express how the abuse made you feel and it also reminded you of things that your stepfather had said to you. You found life very difficult as past memories and feelings came to the surface. Despite this, you have many strengths, including intelligence, determination and self-awareness, and you recognise the need to revisit some of the feelings from the past. So I hope that gives you a tiny sense of what a formulation might look like. Um, you can see it's actually based on what we know about the effect of trauma. You know, some people who hear voices it can be understood as a reaction to trauma. I'm sure you know that, many of you. So it's based on evidence, it's based on experience, and it suggests some ways forward, and it doesn't involve telling someone they have schizophrenia. Okay, it's an alternative to that. Very importantly, it's actually about someone's strengths as well as their struggles. So a diagnosis about what's wrong with you, this is much more about how well you've done to survive, yeah? you have strengths, we can find a way forward. From my point of view, if you have a formulation, you don't need a diagnosis. There's no point saying at the end of this, and it's also because you've got schizophrenia. Doesn't make sense, does it? However, I think in the UK, there's a bit of a battle of ideas going on. I don't know if it's the same here. Yeah, people are saying yes. So one way the battle is happening is that some people would say formulation is something you add on to a diagnosis. So schizophrenia, you, you develop schizophrenia because you were abused by your stepfather. Do, do you see what I mean? So that'd be a formulation plus a diagnosis. And from my point of view, if you've got a formulation, you don't need a diagnosis. You really don't. And there's also a bit of a battle about the trauma stuff. So there's a new chapter in DSM about things that are caused by trauma, in essence, but they haven't got rid of all the other chapters <laughs> called schizophrenia and personality disorder and the rest of it. And actually, from a trauma-informed view, you know, most, not all, but many of those diagnoses could be seen as uh, trauma reactions, trauma responses. So this is the battle that's going on, and it's not about psychologists fighting psychiatrists because actually a lot of psychiatrists agree with us and a lot of psychologists don't so it's much more about people's ideas so that's a bit of the uk background all of this stuff led up to this statement you don't need to read all these words but this is a statement put forward by the division of clinical psychology so that is the organization for all clinical psychologists in the uk and the Division of Clinical Psychology is a small part of the British Psychological Society. Um, and the Division of Clinical Psychology in 2013, at exactly the same time as DSM-5 came out, put out this statement saying, in essence, there's a need to move away from a, the diagnostic model. You know, we've run, we've reached the end of this, it's not working. We need to think differently. We need to drop the diagnostic model, drop the disease model. So as far as I know, we're the only organisation in the world that said that. And of course, it caused a lot of, you know, uproar, really, because not all psychologists agree with that, although some do. And some psychiatrists, like some of the ones you've had to speak here, were very supportive, but some aren't. Nevertheless, I think it's important that that statement exists. And really, it shouldn't be controversial because even the people who put together the DSM categories are saying 
these are not scientifically valid categories. They are putting millions of dollars into developing an alternative. They're called things like high top and R doc. You don't need to look them up. So I don't think they're going to come up with a new proper diagnostic system, but it shouldn't be controversial to say very publicly, this one's run into the ground. And actually, all mental health staff should know that, all therapists should know that, but most importantly, all service users should know that. They should not be told, you have bipolar disorder, or you have schizophrenia, or you have personality disorder, as though it's a fact, as though it's science, as though it's truth. Because even the people who invented those labels are saying that's not the case. So because of this statement, the Division of Clinical Psychology was happy to give funding to a group of us who decided we were going to try and come up with this alternative. OK, that is stupidly ambitious. And if we'd known it was going to take all our spare time for five years, we'd probably never have done it. So it's probably a good idea we didn't. OK, and we're not claiming this is it, we've done it, but we'd like to think we've got a bit of way down the road. And so that's where the PTM framework came from. Um, this is where we, were, we are heading. This is why you're here tonight. The power threat meaning framework. The people, these people are the people involved in the project. Um, there's nine, nine of us and mostly psychologists. I and Mary Boyle are the um, lead authors. Jackie Dillon and Eleanor Longdon, who you may have come across, are very well-known survivors, people who've been through the psychiatric system and come out the other end and feel it was unhelpful. So it's a co-produced document, that's what we call it in the UK, jointly produced with professionals and service users. And as the project went on, we involved about a total group of about 40 people, about a third of whom had experience of being service users. So... All of us have known each other for many years, so we all kind of understood where we were coming from. But we didn't know quite what we were getting into. Just as well. So I'm going to repeat, this is going to be headlines only. It's a long, complex project. This is the very long version. It's got a very long title. Now, this version is 414 pages long. The good news is you don't have to read it all. In fact, you don't have to read any of it. Um, but the reason it's so long and quite dense and probably not very easy to read is because we're trying to do something so ambitious. We're trying to really gather together all the evidence really against the diagnostic approach and for alternative approaches. We're trying to go right back to the kind of core principles, the philosophy, the underlying ideas. And we're trying to think really from, from scratch, if you like, if we took all that away, what would, what would we be left with and what can we start to think about that looks very different? So you might be interested in Chapter 8, although that's mainly about the scene in the UK, but we've had a go at suggesting alternatives to diagnosis in all the ways in which it's currently used, because it's not just used in services, is it's, it's used for people's access to benefits and so on. It's um, used in the legal system, it's used in research. Now these are just ideas. Obviously we've said nobody should lose the label they need to get their benefits. Of course not. But this system doesn't actually work very well. Could we have other ways of fulfilling those purposes? And we think we, we could. So that's the long document online. This is the shorter document. It's not very short, though. This is the link for all the documents, all the resources, the videos from the launch, a short summary, all of these things up there. It's all free. So the BPS has been very generous and uh, made all these resources free. And indeed, I'm, I hope they're going to be able to send some free copies of the overview as well. So the overview is the framework itself. It's a small part of the bigger document, the actual framework. And the overview also has a guided discussion. I may have time to show you a bit of that. But the guided discussion is about, suppose you're working with someone and you want to introduce these ideas to them and see if it makes sense to them. This is a possible way of doing it. Or suppose you want to think about it in relation to yourself.
because this isn't about those people over there who are mentally ill. This is about all of us. OK, so you might want to look at the guided discussion. There are some appendices which describe good practice, which isn't really based on diagnosis. Because one of the things we're saying is we are already working in lots of ways that don't depend on diagnosis. We're not saying stop everything you're doing and do this instead. We're saying there's a lot of good practice out there and we want to support it and we also might want to develop different ways. That's the, um, the brief overview and I'm showing a five minute trailer which comes from the launch which was January the 12th this year in London and it will just give you a flavour of what we were trying to do. So this is a video from the launch. I'm just really pleased with where it's gone. People have understood what we're saying and engaged with it and I think that's what we wanted. You know, we, we just hoped that people would get it, as yeah. we've said. And it's been such a long journey. <laughs> it's been a hell of a journey, hasn't it? Yeah. But a pr for, I think for all of us, it's a process of reviewing what in nearly all our cases has been a kind of life's work in a way. And sometimes a yes. life's work filtered through very profound and difficult life experiences. So it's been enormously satisfying, I think, in the end, oh, I think to come been. up with something that feels, that feels like it kind of validates all, everything that led up to it. This new framework is a way of saying we are now taking on board both the criticisms, but also providing alternatives about causes and meanings, because causes and meanings in human life are important, whether or not you've got a mental health problem. So this is just a way of doing it, which doesn't involve any longer putting people in diagnostic boxes which have been invented by professionals. We're very keen that this was a framework which is essentially offering people an alternative to the traditional diagnostic framework, which of course some people have found helpful and we acknowledge that in the document. And um, But you know, myself and many other people have found that having diagnoses imposed on us and no alternatives being offered um, actually, well not just unhelpful, and so, in, in sometimes actually really, really traumatising um, to have kind of very real things just turned into symptoms and then medicalised. I think for me the, the absolute key message is that distress happens from the outside inwards. That, 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 that for me has been my, my, my guiding principle with this, with all my thinking about the, the project and all, all, all the ways the project has developed it's to get to an understanding of how it is that people who experience difficult life events or unusual combinations of adverse circumstances how distress happens for them in ways that doesn't hold them personally responsible or culpable. I think this framework is really really welcome and it, it's going to substantiate and provide so much more richness and explanation to some of the things that social workers have known for a very long time, some of the models that we work to, it's going to enable us to have discussions across the different professions about how we can come together on a different way of understanding uh, mental health illness and mental health problems and mental distress. And it's delightful to see 400 people here today to celebrate this, uh, this very important step forward. Well, I think, like we've said today, one of the things uh, about this kind of framework is is really trying to make sense of what is often uh, seems quite uh, surprising, unusual kinds of experiences that can happen to people when they feel distressed. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is try to provide a framework for making sense of that and making links between what's happening for people and what's happening in their lives and what's happened in the past as well. It's just that kind of real lived experience that is really coming across um, very powerfully. And for me, I place a lot of value in people with lived experience being in control of you know, how their stories are told, but also um, what kind of responses most make sense to them. People are really hungering for alternative ways of making sense. So, I, yeah, it's fantastic. You know, really, I found the day really useful. I found all the presentations, you know, funny, enlightening, uh, really made me think in a different kind of way. So, I'm really quite excited about the future. It's been fantastic. It's really exciting. Um, 
I think, you know, we live in, a, 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 in an era of austerity where it often feels like where everything's going downhill, there's more and more, there's more and more difficulty, less and less resources, and so this is, the, the, you know, it's great to, to hear an idea about hope, really, and new ways of looking at things. Great, thank you. So, um, that was January. It seems quite a long time ago. It's had a when we reached the end of this mammoth document, thinking, thank goodness we finished with this, we had no idea really what the reception was going to be. And actually the reception has been uh, better than we could have hoped for, in a sense that it's created an awful lot of interest. This is early days yet, of course, but it's created interest from people who are teaching on nursing, social work, clinical psychology courses in the UK, people who are researching, people who are working in practice, psychologists who want to do their formulations slightly differently, a range of different ways. And it's also, there's a Spanish version, there's going to be an Italian version. I'm going to go to New Zealand and Australia to talk about it with John Crombie. So this was more than we could have hoped for. It's also created, as you might expect, quite a backlash. So we've been told a number of unpleasant and untrue things, like, um, we're Scientologists, do you get that over here? If you criticise psychiatry. <laughs> yes, we, you, of course we're Scientologists, why, why else would we have done it? Um, we're extreme Marxists, but we're also members of the alt-right. I don't quite know how that fits together. And a lot of other stuff, which, you know, we are very open to hearing sensible criticisms. I mean, indeed, we have some useful criticisms, but clearly a lot of this is not about sensible criticisms. However, it's made an impact for a, a dense academic document that nobody has to read. It's made a big impact, which is good. And I'm now going to just, this is finally what you're here for, I'm going to um, try to explain to you a little bit what we're saying in this document. As I say, just headlines, really, because it's complicated, but in essence, we're trying to move beyond the DSM mindset. Mary Boyle came up with that term. So what we mean is it's not just about saying instead of these diagnoses, we'll say this. It's about a whole way of thinking that diagnosis kind of implies and that diagnosis supports. It's about all the ways of thinking that we tend to fall into without even realising it, the language we use, the assumptions we make. Everything depends on a certain way of thinking about distress, which we disagree with. And... So what we're trying to do is move away from medicalization. What that means is assuming that the models that we've developed in science to understand what goes wrong with people's bodies, which actually work pretty well in medicine, don't they? They work pretty well. Assuming that those models can also be a, a help us to understand people's thoughts, feelings and behaviours. But those are very different experiences, aren't they? And we are saying those, those illness models are not suitable for understanding people's thoughts, feelings and behaviours. We need to understand people within their relationships, within their social environments. They're pe people who make choices, who make meanings. It's not like something goes wrong with your kidney or your, some aspect of your body. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and of course, in the UK, no doubt here, there is a lot of research into psychological and social causes of people distress. It isn't just all about, you know, chemical imbalances and so on. So there's a mass of research that shows that psychological and social events of all types increase the risk of people becoming distressed. But it tends to get a bit stuck at these points. So what the research tends to show is that everything causes everything. There are lots of factors that seem to make lots of mental illnesses more likely. Yeah, Everyone has experienced an, an everything. Most people in services have had a whole range of difficult things happening to them. And everyone suffers from everything. If you hang around in services long enough, you'll get at least four or five or six or seven or eight diagnoses. Yeah, So that's the problem. So within this big picture, how do we find patterns? That's what we're asking. How do we find patterns within that bigger picture? 
in the UK, as I said, and everywhere, I'm sure, we already, if we're sitting down one to one with people, particularly if we're, you know, therapists of most kind, you know, we're already working in non-diagnostic ways, but we don't have a bigger framework that supports that, that says this is the right way to do it. There is evidence to support this. And these are particular ways, patterns of looking at distress that might help you in your one-to-one -one work or your family work. Does that make sense? So we're trying to fill in that, that big gap, if you like. And in filling in that gap, we've drawn quite a lot on formulation and quite a lot on trauma-informed perspectives, but the framework's bigger than that. Okay, it's actually more ambitious than that. So it's not an official DCP or BPS model. This isn't something all psychologists have to do. It's a document for people to discuss. It's not a replacement for existing models. It's kind of bigger than any particular model. So you might still be very much wanting to do your systemic or your CBT or your existential therapy, but you might also look at that from the bigger perspective that the framework offers. It, we certainly hope it isn't just for professional use only, and I may have time to show you some examples from peer support groups in the UK who have picked this up and without any input from professionals have used this framework to try and make sense of their own stories. So it's really meant to be knowledge for everybody, not special knowledge that professionals have. It's a set of ideas and it's a first stage. Okay, so what are we doing? We're trying to do all the things that diagnosis says it does, but actually does quite badly. So diagnosis, you don't need to read all that, but diagnosis is meant to be about all the evidence about what causes distress. It's meant to be about grouping the same kinds of experience together. It's meant to be about suggesting ways forward. It's meant to be about a basis for research. It's meant to be about how do we make certain decisions about organising services and so on. We think diagnosis does all those things badly. We think our framework could do them all better. But we also think that our framework has these important messages, which diagnosis doesn't have, which are that emotional distress is an understandable response to what's gone on in your life. We are really keen to restore the link between distress and social injustice. The person who is in distress, the social injustice of the environment they probably live in, diagnosis makes, you know, puts, pushes those two things apart. We want to put them back together. They are linked. We want to increase people's access to power and resources. We want to find a way of creating validating narratives and we want to promote social action. This is not just about what happens one to one. It's very much about what happens at a whole societal level. OK, it's about social policy and health policy and social injustice and all those things. So because it's a long and complicated document, we've tried to summarise it in terms of four quite simple questions. OK. So these are the four questions, and they are a way of building on the question which we've already discussed, which is about instead of asking what's wrong with me, ask what's happened to me. So you can expand that, you can build on that question, and you end up with this. What has happened to you in terms of the power threat meaning framework that translates as how is power operating in your life? And I'm going to explain that a bit more in a minute. How did it affect you? In terms of the framework, that can be understood as what kind of threats does this pose? What sense did you make of it? In terms of the framework, that means what is the meaning of those experiences to you? What did you have to do to survive? In terms of the framework, that means what kinds of threat responses are you using? And these are not separate questions in a way. Each question arises out of the other. As soon as you start talking about power, you realise you're also talking about threat. As soon as you start talking about threat, you realise you're also talking about meaning. But it's meant to be a kind of simple way of 
getting your head round, of understanding the basic questions and the basic ideas. And if you want to use this in practice, you will probably want to add or perhaps start with what are your strengths and at the end, what is your story? And that can be any type of story. Doesn't have to be the thing we called a formulation. We really, really wanted to make it clear that any kind of narrative can be useful. So it might be a formulation, it might be poetry, it might be music, it might be art therapy, it might be all sorts of community rituals or stories that people tell, not in services at all or in different cultures. So that's why we've used the word narrative, because narrative is a bigger word than a formulation. Okay, formulation is a particular kind of narrative. So any kind of story in any form that makes sense to the person. And as I said, if you want to actually try this out with someone you're working with or for yourself, you need to look at Appendix 1, Guided Discussion, and it will talk you through that. So a closer look at what we mean by power, threat, meaning and threat responses. What has happened to you? The first question, how is power operating in your life? There's lots of ways of defining power, and those are two possible ways. It's how we obtain security and advantage, or it's being able to influence your environment to meet your own needs and interests. So being in control of your life, being able to you know, help your life and the life of those close to you and your family to get what they need. And we've divided power up into a number of different types of power. Again, you don't need to read all this. It's quite a dense slide, but here it is. So legal power, economic and material power, interpersonal power. That's what we're most used to looking at at therapists, I think, isn't it? How people have hurt us or let us down or bullied us. Biological or the power associated with our bodies. Coercive power, that means forcing people to do things. Social cultural capital. Is, is that a familiar term? So some of us, and I'm one of them, have much more privilege due to birth or education and so on and know our way around the world and know how to get what we want. And some of us are very much excluded from that. We have much less um, information, knowledge, access, confidence to get things uh, that we may need. And finally, ideological power. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So... The main thing that I think we see where the framework is putting back is a real focus on power. In a way, everything starts with thinking about power. And this is the bit that's missed out of nearly all therapies. It's certainly missed out of the medical model. It's missed out of most of our work, and that's not an accident. So everything follows from putting power back in the picture. Ideological power, a particular form of power, you can define it as power over meaning, language and perspectives. It's probably the least obvious form of power, but it's part of every other form of power. And it means when our thoughts, beliefs and feelings are ignored or discounted or disbelieved. When people tell us what to believe, what to think. In the mental health and the criminal justice system, we would see telling people that they are individually mad or bad as a use of ideological power. It's like very powerful systems saying it's something wrong with you, yeah? So ideology, by ideology, what we mean is a whole set of beliefs about the way the world is, and it's not very easy to prove or disprove them. But nevertheless, they're a powerful set of beliefs which we often don't question. They have a particular view of the world and we use various types of language to convey those messages, to support those messages. And very often ideologies work to make powerful people more powerful and less powerful people less powerful. So for example, in the UK, we have this whole austerity narrative going on. Yeah, so it doesn't seem to be working. It's a whole set of ideas about how people ought to pull themselves together and try harder to get jobs and it's individual competition and it's cutting back on welfare systems. And we have a whole set of 
uses of language like people on benefits are lazy, they're welfare scroungers or whatever, and we've all got to pull in our belts and all this kind of stuff. So that's an example of an ideology. And meanwhile, rich people are getting richer and there are homeless people on every street corner and food banks. It's really quite awful what's happening. But this is driven by an ideology. D does that make sense? Yeah. So from the point of view of the framework, we would see medical model psychiatry as a very good example of an ideology. It does not have evidence to support it. It has never had evidence to support it. It is driven very by very powerful vested interests. You can see what those are, everybody from drug companies downwards and upwards. Clearly, it works in favour of people who are already more powerful and very often to the disadvantage of people who were already less powerful. That's why they're in services in the first place very often, because they're less powerful, because they have little power and awful things have happened to them. So one of the things that we have been emphasising is that one of the ways in which less powerful people are badly treated, and it's not a way we always think about, is they are not given sound alternative ways of making sense of their experience. They are told you have bipolar disorder or you have a personality disorder. And if you try to object, you quickly find where the power lies. Yeah. So this is an, a, a misuse of power. You know, it's dressed up like this is a scientific truth, isn't it? But actually, from the point of view of a framework, this is a misuse of power. People are not given alternatives. And we like this phrase, epistemic injustice. It was used by a philosopher called Miranda Fricker to talk about feminist perspectives, about how women's voices may be silenced or undermined. But we think epistemic injustice applies to people who end up in the mental health system. You know, they are deprived of important ways of making sense of their own experiences. Yeah. So one of the aims of the framework is to restore epistemic justice, if you like. That's partly why it's important to us that events are free, that the resources are free, that the launch was free and so on. We didn't want it to be an expensive book or in a journal which you have to pay to access. And of course it's important to remember the less power you have, the more likely it is you use forms of power that people don't approve of. You know, if you can't afford to feed your family, you may steal from a shop, for example. And it's also important to remember power operates positively. We've put more emphasis on negative because that's what we're dealing with, but power operates positively. So the, set, the next question, how did it affect you? What kind of threats does this pose? Well, there's a whole list of ways in which the negative operation of power can affect you badly. You don't need to read all this, but obviously it can affect your relationships, it can affect your feelings and how you deal with them, it can affect your links with your community. These are things we're less used to thinking about in services, I think, but it's very important that people feel part of a community. It affects your economic, your material environment, of course. You may live in a threatening environment, there may be threats to your body, threats of violence or ill health, threats to your value base and your ability to make meaning. So we're back to ideological power in a way. You can see what I mean. All these things are kind of connected with each other. They're not separate. And particularly in a country which has a strong existentialist tradition, you will all be familiar with the idea that it's very important to develop your own values and meanings, isn't it? In that way, the framework is very consistent with those kind of philosophical messages. This is the next question. What sense did you make of it? Those of us who are therapists are used to thinking in these terms, aren't we? What sense did that make to you? What sense did you make of it? But we want to think a bit more deeply about what do you mean by meaning? Okay, what do you mean by meaning? I think there's a tendency to assume meaning is something that kind of happens in your head, a bit like a kind of typewriter or something like that. It's just to do with thinking. And actually, that's not a helpful way always of looking at it. 
So we've actually don't really go along with this whole idea that thoughts are separate from uh, feelings, the sort of CBT assumption. And actually not all cultures see thoughts as somehow separate from feelings. So we don't go along with that. We also don't go along with the idea that meanings are separate from our bodies. So if you think about it, many of the people we work with and all of us at times will experience a sense of shame. Yeah, that's a thought, isn't it? At one level, it's a it's an emotion, but it's also a bodily feeling, isn't it? A kind of this kind of feeling. So it actually doesn't make sense to kind of chop these up into bits. So meaning is complex. Meaning is to do with lots of aspects of our experience. Our bodies, our feelings, our memories, our relationships, our environments. Okay, so again, we're going to go back to ideological meanings again. Because where do we get our personal meanings from? Well, they come from social discourses, sorry about the jargon, but common understandings in a given society about certain sets of meanings. So what do we commonly understand about what it is to be mentally ill? What do we commonly understand about how to be a good mother? What do we commonly understand about refugees, for example? So our personal meanings don't just happen inside our heads, do they? We draw, we develop them from all the messages we get from outside. And those messages themselves are support, you know, have ideological aspects. It's really important to put all those layers back, otherwise we end up with a very individual, you've got to tweak your thoughts, you've got to think differently. Yeah, your negative cognitions, that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that's of no use, but on its own, that's actually not a helpful message, is it? It's not a lot more helpful than saying tweak your chemicals in your brain, is it? Tweak your thoughts. So as therapists, we're very used to focusing on personal meanings. And of course, that can be helpful. But to give a rather obvious example, I mean, I've worked with many women who were raped. And nearly all of them say, I feel so ashamed. It was my fault. I shouldn't have been in that place at that time. I shouldn't have worn those clothes, I should have said this instead. And after you've seen 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 women all saying the same thing, then you have to ask, I think, well, where did that meaning come from? Well, it comes from social discourses, doesn't it? It comes from what we assume about women and their sexuality and men and their sexuality and all the rest of it. And all of those meanings have ideological aspects. So as long as we can sort of blame the victim, we don't have to look clearly at the huge amount of violence that goes on in women's and girls' lives. Does that kind of make sense? So it's really important to put those messages back. And of course, one way of doing that is by working in groups. One of the more powerful ways, if you have a whole group of women who've experienced rape or sexual abuse, then it's much easier for them all to say, well, of course it wasn't your fault. You know, so maybe it wasn't my fault. So where do the messages come from? So maybe we need to put the messages back where they belong. Yeah, and there are examples for men too. Okay, works, works always. So that's meaning. And finally, what did you have to do to survive? If you remember an hour ago, we talked about threat responses. So this is the kind of trauma-informed stuff, isn't it? Instead of symptoms, these are threat responses. So we've borrowed a lot of this from the trauma-informed stuff. We've all evolved to respond to threats, and they're partly based in our bodies, fight, flight, freeze, but they're also based in all sorts of cultural messages, like, or the availability of drink or drugs, let's say, or, but you can see, for, I mean, the UK, for example, an awful lot of young people are self-harming and you know self-harm used to be something that was quite rare but it's become a way of expressing distress that is kind of at some level acceptable doesn't mean people aren't distressed but there's a kind of social cultural element to that so what did you have to do to survive and you can think of these threat responses very roughly from more biologically based fight, flight, freeze. We don't have a lot of control over it up to things like I'm going to use drink or drugs or self-harm. 
where we perhaps have a bit more control, but where there's a lot more cultural influence. Does that make sense? So they're kind of on a spectrum. So here's some examples of threat responses. In medical language, these are symptoms. In the framework and in trauma-informed practice, they are threat responses. So the more biological ones, preparing to fight, flight, all the way down to things which don't necessarily count as symptoms. Okay, so from the PTM framework point of view, things like working too hard or being too perfectionist can also be seen sometimes as threat responses, but nobody's going to diagnose you or make you take pills for it because it's valued by society. But all the same, those may be unhelpful. They may be threat responses. And similarly, some of the things that will automatically get you labelled, like hearing voices, in the framework we're saying they don't have to be threat responses. They certainly don't have to be symptoms. That is how some people experiencing themselves experience themselves, and that's fine. That's fine. That is a different way of experiencing yourself, which is more common in some circumstances and some cultures. So our list of threat responses isn't exactly the same as a list of mental health symptoms. So this is what I've just said. Some of these are seen as desirable and they're to some degree culture specific. Threat responses will vary. Self-starvation, anorexia, doesn't happen all around the world. Happens much more commonly when you introduce Western ideas about being thin and televisions and media and so on. We seem to waste an awful lot of time in mental health research asking questions like what causes depression. Have you noticed that? So if depression isn't a single thing and isn't a medical thing, if you instead ask what causes people to be desperate, unhappy, miserable, stuck, despairing, suicidal and trapped, well, the only possible answer is lots of things, isn't it? It's a silly question. It's a very silly question. So we think it makes much more sense to ask, what is this experience doing for you? What is its purpose? Doesn't necessarily mean you're consciously doing it for that reason, but it's there for a function, it's there for a reason. So we very roughly put together a list of very common human needs. This isn't a complete list, this is a little bit of it. So regulating our overwhelming feelings, getting control of our feelings, we all need to do that, particularly if we've been through very distressing experiences. How do we cope with our feelings? And we might use any one of those threat responses. Yeah, All those threat responses might be used for different purposes. But it doesn't really make sense to ask what causes people to carry out rituals or what causes people to harm themselves. You know, it, it depends. The question is, what is that doing for you? Similarly, we all need to protect against losing our relationships. We all depend on close relationships and we might use, do, lots, do that in lots of different ways. One of the main purposes of the framework is to restore the link between threats and threat responses. And another way of saying the same thing is to say one of the main purposes of the framework is to put back the link between personal distress and social injustice. Okay, and as soon as you add a diagnosis, you lose that link. So it's very common sense in a way. We all know that people who live in deprived areas where there's high unemployment, where there are few jobs, where there are few resources, are more likely to be depressed. We all know that, don't we? And in the UK, those areas have very high levels of so-called antidepressants. So we know there's a link, don't we? It's common sense. But as soon as we realise that, we start saying there's an epidemic of depression and they all need to take pills for it. Do you, do you see what I mean? And then we lose the link. Then we focus on the thing that's called depression, the medical illness. And so a point of the framework is to put these links back in such a way that you can't not see it, if you like. It's a kind of blindness, isn't it? A social blindness. And there are all sorts of reasons why, as a society, we 
we sort of see these links and then we immediately turn away and we lose the links. So some of the reasons are because the threats might be a long time ago or the person might not remember them very clearly or they might not have got enough trust to tell you about them yet or there might be lots and lots of them so it's a bit hard to work out you know what's causing what or there might be lots and lots of different threat responses and some of them might look quite strange so we don't really understand them we think that may be an illness so there's all sorts of reasons why we don't make those links. But perhaps the main reason is that mental health professionals are trained to obscure the link by giving and using diagnoses which impose a powerful expert narrative of individual deficit and illness. It gets quite a controversial statement. Professionals of all types are trained you know, to not really look at the link or only look at it within a limited sense. And we impose that on the people we work with as professionals. And of course, there are reasons for that. We're right back to ideological power again. It's very convenient for us at all sorts of levels. It's convenient for us not to have to listen to people's often very, very distressing, painful stories. It's convenient for us as a society not to think about, well, why are so many people living in this area self-harming and using drugs and alcohol and taking pills? So I think let's have about five minutes of questions and then you're doing very well because it looks like everyone's still awake. That's, that's, that's very good. You said before that um, hearing voices not necessarily had to be a threat response. It could just be a way of functioning that is just the way you are. Yeah. But how do you then define what is a threat response and what is just a way of being? Is it, yeah. um, is it only when it is distressing for the person that it's a threat response or how do you define it? That's an interesting question because I think as professionals we have a great need to define things and draw black and white lines and say, this is normal, but this isn't. So I think part of the answer is, well, we can't necessarily draw clear lines. And for some people, something like hearing voices may sometimes be a threat response, may sometimes be a valued part of their experience that they wouldn't want to be without. And really the only test is to talk to the person themselves, isn't it? And to find out if they're finding it distressing and if they want some support with it. But I think we have to live with that, that uncertainty and actually listen to and respect people's own accounts of what it feels like to them. How do you see the difference between how does this affect one and how do they respond? Because um, the effect must yeah. obviously also yeah. be a response. So how does it affect you? What kind of threats does this pose? What do you have to do to survive? What kinds of threat response are you using? Well, that's also a good question because there isn't a clear difference. There isn't. And again, that's something to emphasise. I think this is a slightly artificial way of dividing it. If you want to try out the guided discussion, you will find that as soon as you've worked through the first question, you sort of already answered quite a few of the other questions. So the answer is there isn't a clear distinction, really. And really the purpose of asking these questions is to help people think about their feelings, their reactions, to offer different ways of understanding and to give them some ideas for what, what their story is about, how their story makes sense to them. The threat response, in a way, is what you actually do at some level to survive, I suppose. That's sort of what it is, but there isn't a clear distinction between that and, and the threat. When I've shared the guide discussion with people, which helps people to talk these through, people have started treating it like a kind of assessment interview. So I don't know which bit goes in which box. You know, it's, re it's meant to be a, a way of prompting thoughts and ideas and a discussion and a conversation. I wonder if you could actually not ask how did this affect you, but ask how did you respond to this? Absolutely. It really doesn't mean you literally ask those questions. Oh. Okay. really doesn't you know these are the areas we need to think about and any way you want to phrase it that makes sense to you that makes sense to the person you're working with i mean i i don't think i've ever invited someone into the room said sit down got up and said what happened to you do, do you know what i mean <laughs> but what i have done is i hope 
said, well, tell me a bit about your life and what was going on then and, you know, what other things might have been happening at the same time. Could you say a little bit more about um, how the framework is used in practice? Because as I understand, it's not just these questions. There's also like you found some patterns or... Uh -huh. So well, how are these patterns being used or...? That's a very useful question because I'm about to talk about the patterns. Okay. A core question for the framework what kind of patterns can we find within a, a very general picture of everything causes everything? Okay, all sorts of psychological and social factors tend to make people more likely to experience distress. What, can we, what patterns can we find if we try and look within that general picture? And this is a little bit complicated, but we've made a kind of a, a conceptual leap, a leap in our thinking, because... Um, patterns in medicine are organised by biology. If you think about it, a pattern in medicine that helps you to diagnose someone with, let's say, cancer or TB or diabetes is based on this happens in your cells, whatever, this affects your pancreas or your kidney or whatever, this leads to these physical symptoms. So those are patterns in biology. And in relation to emotional distress, we are saying that the patterns are organised by meaning, not by biology. I'm going to try and explain this a bit. Uh, it doesn't mean the patterns don't include biology, because as we've said, our biological experiences are part of all our experiences. But they're organised by meaning, not by biology, which I will try to explain in a minute. So... Very simply, that means we can't find the kind of cause-effect links that you might hope to find in medicine or in other branches of natural science. This causes this. Meaning doesn't work like that. Meaning is something we create and do and draw from outside ourselves and that shifts and changes. So if you're talking about patterns that are based on meaning, it immediately becomes obvious that expressions of distress are going to change over time and indeed they do don't they so i don't know if this is true in denmark but in the uk there used to be a lot of hyster victorian women suffering from hysteria apparently we don't see them anymore what happened to them well cultures change meanings change relationships changed and you would also expect that expressions of distress and experiences of distress will be very different across different cultures yeah whether those are within the uk or beyond the uk because cultures are different so this is a big problem for dsm for the for dsm and icd um, because they try to squeeze everything into a diagnostic model but it's not a problem for the framework because that is what you'd expect well, you can take this away and think about it if you want. Patterns of embodied, meaning-based threat responses to the negative operation of power. That is a description of the kind of patterns that we have tried to identify. So the bigger patterns in distress are verbs, not nouns. They are things people do, not things people have. They're not patterns about, I have this illness called bipolar disorder. They are patterns essentially about how I am surviving this particular set of circumstances and they're not a one-to-one -one replacement for diagnostic clusters so there isn't a pattern for personality disorder and a pattern for bipolar disorder what we've done and is very provisionally and i'll be honest with you i think this is the part of the document that needs most work i hope we've outlined some principles but i'm sure these patterns will change i've already had useful feedback i can see ways in which i'd want to write them differently now but in essence we've made a start by outlining seven general patterns which are based on evidence they are based on literature they are based on what the research says but they cut across diagnostic categories they cut across specialties and they cut across so-called normal and abnormal and each pattern has other patterns within it, which we may or may not have time to look at. So what is the point of the patterns? Well, there's a number of points of the patterns, but part of the point of the patterns is because they're like a, they're like a, a big formulation, a meta-narrative, a meta-formulation. So part of the point of the patterns might be if you have a one-to-one -one story of someone and they have a look at the patterns, they might be able to see, oh, well, that actually describes me quite well. 
or they might not, it's up to them, or they might find several patterns which they can relate to. So that might help people to feel, as they sometimes say diagnosis does, I'm not alone, this is understandable, it's not just me, it's not surprising I feel like this. And similarly, if you were trying to put together your story or to work with someone else who is putting together their story, if you looked at one of the patterns, you might say, oh, it looks like this quite commonly happens. Is that something that you've experienced? So it might help to fill out someone's story. In a bigger sense, what we're trying to do is to provide evidence that working with people's narratives is acceptable, is based in evidence, is sensible, you know, does fit in with what we know at all sorts of levels. Yeah, it is, narrative isn't just something you do because you're not clever enough to be a doctor and give a diagnosis, you know. It's actually an evidence-based and effective and important way forward and there are patterns within narratives that we can draw on helpfully. These are briefly some descriptions of the patterns. I'm just going to try to give you a flavour about what this might look like. So pattern number four, surviving separation and identity, identity confusion. You don't have to use the word surviving, of course. You could use coping with or managing. You can see this is about something people do rather than not what they have. Someone who's struggling to survive a certain set of difficulties, expressed in terms of what it means to them. So like many of you, I expect I've worked with a number of young people aged about 18, 19, 20, early 20s, who seem to be, who have labels of things like psychosis or OCD or anorexia sometimes, and yet at the bottom of their difficulties, there often seem to be a struggle to separate from their family and go out into the world and work out who am I, what are my values, what do I want to do with my life, what kind of person am I? Do you see what I mean? So there seem to be a common dilemma, a common problem, a common set of meanings, even though there were different diagnoses. So that seemed to be part of a bigger pattern. Does that make sense? Um, this pattern, now many people, but not everybody who gets a diagnosis of depression will say they feel trapped and you know they experience loss and they feel defeated. So that's a different way of putting it than saying you've got an illness called depression. Yeah, those are common themes and meanings. This pattern number six actually describes a great many, nearly all men who end up in the criminal justice system, who very typically, and we have lots of evidence to support this, come from backgrounds where they are socially excluded, where there's violence in the home, where they grow up feeling ashamed, where they don't have positive male role models. So it's not, it's not a pattern for people in prison, but it does describe the experience of quite a lot of people who end up in prison. So now I'm going to take another step and think about if these are meanings, they're personal meanings at one level, but we've also said that personal meanings come from social discourses, come from wider cultural meanings, so in Western or Westernised countries, it's likely that these patterns at some level, if you pick up, pick, go down and down and down and down and down, you will find yourself bumping up against a common cultural meaning which isn't usually questioned. Yeah? In Western or Westernised countries, we tend to assume that these kind of things are, are just how things are and how you leave your li lead your life. So we tend to assume that aged about 18 to 20 or whatever, you separate from your family and you go off and build up your own life. And you also have to do all these things. You have to get a job and a nice house and own a car. So if we think about the young people I talked about who could perhaps be described by a pattern about struggling with separation and identity, at some level, they are clashing with a cultural assumption, aren't they? A social norm. At some level, they are feeling, I ought to be able to do this and I can't. Or people are telling them, you ought to be able to do this and yet you're struggling. And the question that the framework raises, I think, is, well, maybe the problem is with the assumption 
maybe that's an awful lot to expect. Maybe it's not that the person has OCD or anorexia. Maybe that's not the, the main problem. Because not all cultures have a nuclear family structure, do they, in an extended family structure, which is known to be in many ways better for people's mental health. You wouldn't have exactly that dilemma, would you? You might have other dilemmas. So if you look at any of these, you know, how many people who hear voices might never be labelled or diagnosed if they lived in a culture where that was acceptable? OK, there's a clash with a set of assumptions, isn't it? So maybe the problem is in the assumptions, not in the individual. And the same applies to all of these. We're back to kind of ideological assumptions again, because, of course, there are historians would say there are reasons we end up with let's say a nuclear family structure rather than an extended family structure and it goes along with the rise of industrialization and so on and the need for families to be mobile and move around the country to take up jobs and so on so in all sorts of ways we are putting back the bits that get obscured and helping distress to be understood less as an individual who's got it wrong or can't do it and more as a set of expectations that maybe are problematic maybe that's more where the challenge needs to be and one of the things the framework does quite well I think is answer that question that people often say which is well I didn't have a trauma I wasn't abused by my, my uncle I wasn't beaten up you know that's true. Lots of people do not have a specific trauma in their background, and yet they may be very distressed. But it's very likely they are clashing with some kind of social norm or assumption, which can be every bit as painful. But it's harder to see, isn't it? People tend to feel even worse about it. You know, I haven't even got a reason. I had a loving family. Well, they probably did. But, you know, we all live in a difficult world. We need to be honest and be able to look more clearly at what those difficulties are. So I want to talk about what we think about by culture. It's a slightly problematic word. So as I've said, if these are meaning-based patterns, of course people's expressions of distress are going to be different in different cultures. Of course they are. And that is a real problem for DSM and ICD, because from their point of view, we have to go and squeeze that back into diagnostic categories. So we end up with lots of silly questions like, is this the way people get depressed in China? Yeah. Or is this a form of schizophrenia that we only see in villages in central Brazil or something like that? Do, do silly, silly questions. And so the DSM answer is to have and a, a chapter at the end called culture bound syndromes which means kind of strange things that we don't quite understand in <laughs> diagnostic terms so we'll put them in this chapter and of course what a silly heading because all expressions of distress are culture bound if you like aren't they that's what we've just been saying there's no such thing as an expression of distress that isn't influenced by culture but nevertheless that's what uh, the, the DSM answer, but this is not a problem for the PTM framework. And one of the messages we would like to come out of this is we need to respect and actually learn from the ways that very different cultures, non-Western cultures, understand and experience and express and heal distress. We have an awful lot to learn from that. What's happening at the moment is that there's a movement for global mental health which is exporting our diagnostic model and our pills across the globe and i think that's extremely damaging at the very moment when it's failing in the countries and the cultures where it was developed it's being promoted across the world and i don't just mean psychiatry i mean narrow versions of psychology as well so i'm going to show you an example from the culture bound syndrome dsm4 talks about spirit possession they don't know what to do with spirit possession so they've said is this really a form of psychosis and it's in the um one of their appendices here's an example of spirit possession 
One version, Sen, is found in northern Uganda where civil war has resulted in widespread brutality and the abduction and forced recruitment of children as soldiers. Some young people report that their identity has been taken over by the evil ghost of a dead person. Sen has been found to be associated with high levels of war trauma and with abduction. And the spirit was often identified as someone the abducted child had been forced to kill. So we could understand this within the power threat meaning framework without having to call it schizophrenia or psychosis. Do you, do you see what I mean? It makes sense, doesn't it? We don't need a different word. Call it what it's called in, you know, wherever it happens. So we've been pleased to be contacted by a number of people working with indigenous peoples saying, I'm really pleased to see this, not because I'm going to suddenly start using this framework instead, but because it tends to support the work that I'm doing in culturally appropriate ways, you know, with Native Americans or Maori people or whatever. So that's very important. So we're coming right back to the theme of narratives. So these are the things we're arguing. Storytelling and meaning making are universal human skills. We all do it. The framework provides evidence for the central role of narrative of all kinds as an alternative to diagnosis. Narratives are a way of witnessing and healing both within and beyond services. They're not a kind of second best. They're not a kind of sitting and chatting to someone. They're not a something that hasn't got proper evidence to support it. The evidence-based general patterns support the construction of particular narratives. Art, music, theatre, etc. are just as valid as written narratives, as are community ceremonies, myths and rituals. The PTMF, it includes what we normally think of as evidence, but it goes beyond... We, we've actually criticised the notion of what counts as evidence. That's a whole other area which I haven't got into. But in terms of narratives, narrative truth is as important as historical truth. Whether a story makes sense to me, whether it seems to fit, whether it feels right, whether it helps me to move on, those kind of truths, that kind of evidence is just as important. Alec Grant, who's a, a mental health nurse, has talked about how all professions need to have narrative competence, a real ability to understand, to listen, to work with people's stories. These are quotes from the framework. Judith Herman has talked about the restorative power of truth telling, how important, how healing it is to tell the truth and have people witness and listen to it and believe it. And Jackie Dillon and Rufus May have talked about a process of reclaiming our experience in order to take back authorship of our own stories. So these are obviously ideas we've borrowed from all sorts of sources, but we very much support them. We hope the framework supports them. And we hope that we can once again put narrative and truth telling and its wider links to social justice back in the picture. Thank you. And now, cups of tea. A group of um, service users who meet weekly to support each other and who have used the framework. And I've got an illustration of how they've used it. I hope, hope this is OK. Otherwise, it could seem a bit abstract. So this is based on the guided discussion that I've talked about. And the leader of the group is called Amanda. She's given me permission to use these examples. It's a group that's set up in a very safe way. So they took the framework questions quite slowly and carefully. And they talked about them each week. And at the end of each week, they had ways of keeping yourself safe for the next week and looking after yourself and so on. But Amanda used the story for herself, the group facilitator, and she also helped other people to come up with their own stories. So she had to think about the impact of power, first of all. And that is, I'll leave you to read that for yourself, and you don't need to read every word, but that is what she said about the impact of power in her own life. So this is based on the guided discussion, which is talking you through how these questions and ideas might apply to you and your life. She then had to think about the threats. So I think you can see there's no clear distinction between power and threats in a way, but 
somebody asked a question about the difference between threats and threat responses. So this is the sense that she made of threats. She suffers from flashbacks, she feels angry, misunderstood, she has overwhelming emotions. She's stuck in a sort of fight and flight mode, so she often feels desperate and suicidal. These are the meanings. She believes that she's worthless, undeserving, something wrong with her, the world's unsafe, and that there's no way forward. And I would hope that in a group setting that in time other people would be able to persuade her there are other meanings, that she's also resilient and resourceful and has come a long way and has done a brilliant job in setting up the group and so on. She uses a number of threat responses, which are things like being very obedient in relation to powerful people. That's an interesting one, because of course normally we'd see that as being a good patient, but she is seeing that as a threat response, which makes sense. Uh, she's very cautious and wary of people. She sometimes gets angry because she thinks she's in danger, and then sometimes staff react badly and label her because of that. And uh, she sometimes doesn't eat properly, and she kind of uses various ways of numbing her pain. So those are threat responses, not medical symptoms. She also is able to say she's got a lot of strengths and resources. She understands the psychology of trauma. She's intelligent, she's resilient, she stands up for herself. She's really found it helpful to be in this group and to feel she's learning new things and that she's helping other people to learn new things. And she's found some inspiring professionals and she has a lovely family that give her strength and support. So she's put it together in this story. Adverse childhood experiences led to complex trauma throughout my life. Constant repetitive cycles of coercion, powerlessness and multiple forms of abuse have had a lasting effect and are also affecting my physical, emotional and psychological well-being. My energy levels are low. I have been broken and distressed by a disempowering mental health system that has been traumatising to me. So I, tr I struggle to, tr to trust people. I'm still fighting with the mental health services, but I have good relationships with my peers and my family. I'm educating myself. I'm standing up for myself and others. I'm campaigning for trauma-informed services. So the story has positive aspects as well as very difficult ones. And in a slide that I won't show you because it was a bit personal, she's giving me some examples from other people in the group, also saying for the first time I can see that this is why I felt in this way and this is why I had my breakdown and so on. The point to note here is that no professional was involved in this. <laughs> you could call this a formulation. You, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that these ideas have been used without any professional input at all to come up with something that's every bit as you know, resourceful and thoughtful as anything a professional could do and possibly more, and the additional benefit of feeling we're doing this for ourselves. So that's a small example of what the framework might look like in practice. So, should we take some questions? Yes, let's have some questions. Could I ask you to expand a little bit more on the uh, general patterns? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the general patterns, the seven general patterns. What are you using them for? What's the purpose of them? And is there any risk that it might be just another way of categorizing this, uh, what, we, what we're meeting? Uh, and then excluding the uniqueness of the stories. Uh, very good question. There are already people lining up to say, OK, so instead of 12 diagnoses, you've got seven patterns. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, that's a risk. And what we know is that every challenge to the status quo tends to get sucked back into the status quo. So I have no doubt that people will be saying these are just like diagnostic patterns. We've got a whole long section on the difference between our patterns and diagnostic patterns, which you can read if you want. But there, is, there are very fundamental differences between meaning-based patterns and biological patterns. They, they couldn't be more different in a way. And how, do, how might they work? Well, I'll show you an example which might illustrate that. So pattern number six, which is about social exclusion, shame and coercion, which applies to a lot of people who end up in the criminal justice system. 
So I've done quite a lot of work with um, people working in those settings, and we've done a one-to-one -one formulation for all the examples they brought along. Every single one has ended up sounding like a variation of this, which is pattern number six. I mean, again, you don't need to read all that stuff, but every individual pattern so far has turned out to be a variation on this quite common pattern, and this is pattern number six. So the individual narratives tend to be supported by this bigger pattern, and equally, the bigger pattern tends to support the individual personal narrative. And each pattern comes with a particular set of power, threat, meaning, and threat responses aspects, which is not unique to that pattern, but which is quite common in that pattern. So that's one implication of the patterns. Another implication is suppose criminal justice systems were based on the understanding that many people, perhaps most in their services, could be described by this pattern. I'm going to show you the second bit of it. This is the bit that's in a way even more important because this is about where does the pattern come from. It comes from people's lives, which comes from the kind of society we live in. So kind of what I'm trying to say is if we really took these patterns on board, then it'd be much more difficult just to treat these in this case as men who need to be locked up, who of course sometimes people may need to be lo locked up. We'd be much more inclined to look at the circumstances that they come from and think about them as men struggling to survive in difficult circumstances and think about the society that is kind of creating these people in, in, in their thousands. Okay, thank you. And just another second mm. very small question. I do agree when you say that patterns are organized by meaning, not by biology. Mm. But how do you argue that? Because we live how in... Do you, how do you reason that? Reason because, that? Yeah, how, how do you... How do you What's your background for claiming that? Because we're living in a time where a lot of people are claiming that biology actually is organizing the patterns. That's the, <laughs> that's the main discourse that we are up against. Well, obviously there's no evidence for these completely false and misleading claims that they're based on biology. <laughs> Need I say more? The, the people who put these patterns together are saying there's no evidence for that. The document comes from a particular philosophical position, I guess, is part of the answer, as do I. And of course, and that's not a truth either. It is a way of looking at it, which I think is consistent with the evidence, which I think is consistent with what people in distress actually say, which for me is the most important form of evidence. And as a psychologist, I've always worked in a formulation-based way, and formulation is essentially about working with people's meanings. And... I'm much less bothered about randomised control trials than I am about what seems to work in front of my eyes, and I know that formulation-based practice works. So, I, you could call that a, you know, that that is my starting position. But I would also argue that there is evidence to support that. But to some extent, it a, it's a philosophical position. You said that it wasn't necessarily a more conscious way of uh, creating this meaning uh, mm. when you use the word mm. um, but could the the framework be um, a part of the process of actually making this uh, yeah. a, a more conscious um, making of meaning yeah I mean I think a lot of therapy is about making meanings more conscious um, you know why do I feel like this why do I feel I have to behave like this at a much bigger level, I think we are rather ambitiously wanting to make meanings at, a diff at all sorts of different levels more conscious as well, which includes social discourses, which includes deeply held assumptions, which includes cultural norms and ideological meanings. So, and, you know, if I'm optimistic, I would think maybe a little bit of that has gone on in this room today, that maybe we've had a chance to think about our own meanings, you know, so... What are the assumptions I make without thinking? That's what learning is about, isn't it? It's about questioning or unquestioned assumptions and bringing meanings out. And then that gives us a bit more freedom to choose how to act, how to be. But of course, that always operates within limits as well. But yes, that is part of the purpose of the framework. And part of the purpose of evolving it was questioning our own meanings, our own assumptions, which was interesting and, and very challenging at times but we're all still speaking to each other yeah. <laughs>
you really question the basic assumptions and that's really beautiful how should it be applied like in in the world should we should we try to convince psychiatry to use uh, this mm-hmm. kind of framework because I, I I don't trust that that psychiatry with these institutions would would adopt such an approach. If it does, then it will assimilate it to its own yeah, thinking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so what I'm starting to think more and more is that we should have uh, different kind of service centers and give people the freedom of choice to choose medical treatment or something else, yeah, like yeah. a trauma in, in uh, yeah. a trauma focused uh, treatment or whatever one one wants to call it. And I speak as someone who spent a great many years banging their head, my head against a wall of systems that don't want to change. And actually that's something I have in common with all the project authors. We've all spent years, decades, banging our heads against walls and getting very frustrated. So one of our policies in relation to the framework was, well, we've had enough of that. We actually want to produce something that's where we want things to go and put our energies into that and we want to push at open doors and that's both you know a survival response for ourselves (laughs) but actually I think it's a good strategy actually I think it's a good strategy because I think you're right systems will only reform up to a certain point they will take on bits of this people will add a little tiny box called power onto their kind of formulation just under the diagnosis do do, do you know what I mean that's what's going to happen so actually I think we need to be doing something different and I agree with that if you read the stuff about what is it that helps to create a paradigm shift that's a bit of a cliche term but um, what what ingredients need to be in place is the current paradigm needs to be crumbling well it certainly is there needs to be an alternative well there are a number of alternatives and this is one and finally the people who uphold the existing paradigm need to die off (laughs) so if we could outlive them, <laughs> there is hope for change. Yeah. So we don't only need the framework and the thinking. You also need houses, so of some, some 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 place people can actually go. You do w- with another kind of environment, another kind of culture, another kind of language. We do, and the examples of good practice in the back of the overview include things like that, like crisis houses that are not based on a medical model. Like, you know, things like, you know about, I'm sure, open dialogue and hearing voices, do you know what I mean? Or there's not a single answer, is there? There's lots of equally good and impressive ways that we can move forward. And let's put our energy there. I I mean, I agree with you. When you mentioned, like, that it needs to split off from um, mainstream psychiatry, I was wondering about a person sitting in a chair, staring into the wall, saying nothing, Mm. or if they are saying anything, saying, I'm worthless. Mm. Or a person hiding into a corner, afraid of the spiders crawling all over the room, which you can't see. How will you ever get to their stories without aid of medication? And how will you (laughs) give them the aid of medication without having some kind of diagnosis to pin that on? First of all, I'm a bit picky about language, even though, you know, all you wonderful people speak such fluent English. I'm a bit embarrassed to say this, but... Uh, I don't use the word medication in relation to psychiatric drugs because I think that's misleading. These are not treatments for illnesses. Psychiatric drugs do have some uses, and I'm not against all all drug use, and nor is the framework, but they have general sedating or calming or stimulating effects. They don't treat illnesses or correct imbalances. So, actually, I don't think you do need a diagnosis to give someone a pill. That person staring into the wall, antidepressants, can lift that person up to a level where they'll be able to talk to you. I mean, I have worked with people like the ones you've described who really can't talk about anything, who see things that I don't see, you know, who have experiences that I personally haven't experienced myself myself. 
and there are no simple, easy answers. I may have made it sound a bit too simple. An awful lot of people are not going to be ready to sit down and tell a story. I've made it slightly simplistic. But I think there's all the difference in the world between saying this person is stuck because they're having an acute schizophrenic episode and this person is stuck because there are very likely to be all sorts of difficult things going on which they're not yet able to think about or even remember or talk about coherently, but we need to hang on in there and offer support and be with that person and do simple practical things and be reassuring and encouraging until they're ready to tell little bits of their story at whatever pace suits them. And that's part of the purpose of a team formulation for exactly that kind of situation where there's a real temptation, leap in, you know, go down the road a bit more, they need ECT, they're not eating. Do you know what I mean? Terrible stuff, terrible stuff. The purpose of a team formulation is to offer an idea that, you know, we don't yet know if it's right, but allows the staff to feel, well, we can hang on in there, we have reason to do that, we can wait until that person's ready. And some people never want to tell a story, and that's fine. This isn't a new thing, you've got to tell your story, but very few people are going to benefit from, you know, a lifetime on psychiatric drugs. The first diagnostic systems, they were, I mean, they were clearly and explicitly theoretically, uh, theoretically um, based on, 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 on explicit theory. And then later on, one, one tried to make <laughs> theory-free diagnostic categories, but of course they were based on logical behaviorism and, 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 and um, other theories. Then this is, again, a, a framework that is explicitly theory based, right? It's based on a whole number of theoretical assumptions and philosophical principles, yeah. Psychologists work uh, from many different frameworks, different uh, theoretical approaches, and this might be favoring some um, rather than others. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I, I can see this favor a lot of narrative or dynamic approaches yeah. where the story is very important. Yeah. While, um, say, third wave cognitive behavioral therapies are usually not that concerned about stories, but more about what are your challenges now, what are your resources, and, and how can you cope with things right now, and would say it's perhaps even a trap to look the rest of your life for explanations for how you got here. You're right that some psychological approaches have more in common with this than others. So narrative, I think, is one. Psychodynamic approaches, I think, is one. Trauma-informed approaches, community psychology, you know, all of those have quite a lot to say in terms of the framework. But I don't think there's any approach that is kind of, apart from diagnostic one, that is forbidden by the framework. So I know, you know, people who work in from a CBT perspective who do so in a very sophisticated, relationally informed way. And if you have a bigger perspective, a bigger power perspective, it's going to be much more likely that you're choosing perhaps quite a simple solution-focused approach that is appropriate and that feels useful for the person rather than one that, say, because it ignores the impact of power, is experienced as something like, oh, so I've got to sort it out myself now, it's because I haven't worked hard enough at a solution. Do, 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 you, do you see what I mean? It all depends on... I think we have to have the, the widest frame possible in order to work more particularly and more specifically with you know, people in front of us, if we're therapists and professionals. I mean, for example, when people come in private clinic, mm -hmm. they just want, uh, I mean, they come and they pay for each session, so you wouldn't have like, uh, you wouldn't have the th first three sessions to try to explore the wider frames. You would have to go more, more or less directly to something they found um, useful right now. They probably wouldn't come back. Uh, but, but, but I mean, in, no, it's- uh, Then you well, wouldn't get paid. Mm. <laughs> Um, but but it makes a lot of sense. Like for, I mean, there is a looking for some kind of explanations in some sense, uh, and, and I'm wondering if 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 we need explanations for why people suffer, to say, uh, reason that these people should have extra resources. 
or can simply, well, this person is struggling without we having to explain why? Some people's problems are, in a sense, quite simple. I have nowhere to live. I have no money to feed my children. <laughs> in, that, in that case, that's what we need to do. But it doesn't sound like you're exactly asking that. But, you know, I think as professionals, we negotiate with people about what they find helpful and what they want. And if they have three sessions and you have three sessions to offer, there needs to be a negotiation process, doesn't there? But... I don't think that should exclude the possibility of at least us, if we're professionals, thinking about bigger issues and at least making that part of the choice we offer. You know, otherwise there's a default to individualization, which is always dangerous, I think. This is your individual specific problem from inside your head or your feelings. I work with children, mm -hmm. and right now we live in a society where children get a lot of diagnosis, yeah, autism, yeah. ADHD, and stuff like that. And this seems a lot like it's for adults, <laughs> or yeah, you know, you okay. have to be able to think a lot, create meaning, and yeah. how can we implement this for children and perhaps prevent some of the whole... Um, I was... Uh, epidemic of ADHD sure. and autism. Sure. Clearly the implications for children are just as strong. That's where the distress starts, isn't it? That's where we have epidemics of distress and things like ADHD. So um, there's a number of children's and ad child and adolescent services that have taken this on, both in the UK and some other places. It's early days, but clearly there are very profound implications for working with families. And, you know, this... The guided discussion, the questions need adapting for those circumstances, but and I'm pleased to say there are people working on that. So there's somebody working on a version that might be helpful for people with learning disabilities, and there's somebody working on a version that might be helpful for older adults with cognitive impairments. You know, it's all up for grabs, and some of it needs adaptation. But as you rightly say, the principles apply quite broadly. One of the things I'm thinking is because it, uh, to me, and when I'm listening to you, it's definitely a, ho a whole, it's a system way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, there's possibilities of introducing many different, of course, approaches, like mm -hmm. you were talking about open dialogue, CBD, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also thinking, uh, at the moment, it seems like it's being more uh, seen as perhaps a model, and I'm not saying mm -hmm. that it is. Mm -hmm. But is it, uh, uh, in the UK anyway, are you introducing it as a teaching you know framework where this is a possibility in for psychology uh, for example uh, and then where you know you just uh, introduce many other ways of thinking but this is the fundamental philosophy of which the whole psychology degree is going to be built up upon <laughs> that would yeah. be so wonderful yes um yeah. i mean i if i was i used to head up a clinical psychology training course and if i was still doing it i would be basing it all on the framework i mean our, like I said, our philosophy is offer it ideas. We can't possibly take responsibility for what happens to it and everything that happens or doesn't happen. Um, there is a small working party going to be set up to oversee implementation of this, these ideas in various ways. And it's very much our hope that some training courses, for example, would take this on as their fundamental model. And a lot are already teaching it, but of course... That might just mean one session, so to speak. I mean, so I'm going to show you... These are some examples of the ideas being translated into practice that I know about in the UK. So there, is, there are people using it to enhance their existing formulation work. There's someone who ran a, a group based on the framework in a, in a prison service. There's group work. There's peer support. There's um, training, teaching, There's an, it's appearing on a number of undergraduate courses. Thank you for your great presentation. Um, I think maybe, the, for me at least, the most important or the most exciting part of, 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 um, of the framework is the focus on power and social injustice, because that, I think, has really been lacking in, in our training and in the way we, we structure our services, etc. Um, and then I'm wondering how, um, if you could say a bit more about how you work with that also in perhaps both in the, the formulations but also in um you know in in the services because i think very often the services focus on sort of the individual or the immediate surroundings yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and also, I think in the cases that you provided here, there was a focus on sort of the person and the interactions with the immediate surroundings. But I'm sure. also concerned about the sort of the social discourses, the how power also operates as, as ideological power, as you mentioned. Yeah. And how would you work with that sort of by using this framework? Um, also, uh, when, when interacting with a client, like how, how, how do you sort of st steer the, the discussion towards okay. that um, with this framework? In a way, the answer to how do you do it is, you know, please tell us, tell us what's working. We want to share it. This is the point of the group that's going to be set up. We want to encourage you to publish it. We're going to have a complete edition of the Clinical Psychology Monthly Magazine clinical psychology forum on examples of people putting the framework into practice so in, in in a way that's in a way that's the answer in a way that's the answer but some people for example have used the framework to talk about not just their clients but how the team is operating and what pressures the team is under so, and apparently that's been quite helpful because of course whole te teams are part of systems that are often unhelpful and sometimes actually abusive now, how do we get it up to the next level where it might be taken seriously by policymakers and all the rest of it? I mean, I've regularly been asked that. I don't really know the answer. We have some contacts. But it's a curious fact that I don't know if it's the same here, but even the more left-wing perspectives and the Labour Party don't make this explicit connection between social injustice and mental distress i mean that they're, they're all still calling for sort of more money for more of the same services that mess people up in the first place do you know what i mean so that there is a, there is a huge gap in the public discourse and rhetoric you said earlier that the model tried to um, create a link between personal distress and social injustice mm. um but do you yeah people that made the uh, model um, also think that there is just something that happens in families that you can't explain by any social injustice. You just have a bad relationship to your mom because she had a bad relationship to her mom and everyone is rich and everyone is like <laughs> has the best uh, okay. circumstances. Um, or is it just not a part of the idea? I mean, I don't think in working with particular problems or relationships, we always have to go right back and say, what's a social justice issue here? You know, many young women might have difficult relationships with their mothers, etc., etc., etc. And of course, if you wanted to take it further back, then gender roles are deeply embedded in all sorts of assumptions about how life should work and you know who's in control and who has most power and so on. So there would be a link at some level, but it's not necessarily to say you'd always want to explicitly make that link in your work with someone. I mean, you know, sometimes bad things happen. You know, people get caught up in an earthquake. Do you, do you know what I mean? Or, so, I mean, I don't think you have to kind of make a meal of it. With, What's the social injustice in here? Must be there somewhere. I, I do think that this is maybe sometimes more of a theoretical point, but it's an interesting thing to ask. You know, I ask myself quite often, if you trace this back and back and back and back, is there something here that's about social justice? I think the very often, it, or about social norms at least. What you're talking about is very much in line with what the way I'm trying to work and mm. people I know, the way they're trying to work. And uh, so how do we uh, connect, first of all, in Denmark? To, is, is, have you uh, connections, that directly therapeutic connections to other countries? And uh, what does it take to, um, you could say you are like a member of this idea? Or you? Well, I'm really pleased to be here because I seem to be making a number of Danish connections, which is fab. I'm going to be here in August talking at, is it Metalog yeah. conference? Uh, Niels is here, and I, yes, I talked last year, so uh, I was here last year, wasn't I? So, you know, I'm, I'm open to building on connections, and so, so am I, so are the rest of the project team, and a few people are going to come and visit us in London, I hope, from Denmark to we'd very much like to try and arrange a PTM conference to coincide with that. So, you know, let, let's, let's keep in contact. It, it feels like this is 
you know, there's a lot of similar thinking going on, which is really, really encouraging. And if you can get me a Danish passport, port, passport so I never have to go to a po back to a post-Brexit <laughs> UK, I'll do as many talks as you like. A, a word you've used quite a lot, uh, and which has also gone again in a lot of the questions, is, is this word understanding. Mm. Uh, you, you had a, a quote from Alec Grant uh, earlier. Yeah. He said... Uh, yeah. Narif, narrative competence is about deeply absorbing and responding, which is something very other than, than understanding. Uh, is, is, this, is this about understanding? <laughs> is it about under, what, is the framework about yes. understanding? Yes. Goodness. It's because in, um, in a lot of more narrative or, or dialogical approaches, yes. then, then you would be moving away from the idea or the, the ideal of understanding and more yeah, yeah, into the yeah. ideal of responding. Uh, yeah, and okay. I'm wondering where, where you would put this. Ooh, don't know if I can answer that. I mean, that, that, that may be me, the understanding bit from my long... Yeah, it's a bit of a, that's a bit of a psychology thing, that is. You've caught me out. And uh, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, it's it's also it's my it's my kind of formulation approach, which isn't shared by everyone in the project groups. So I think that's a bit of me coming through, and one of the ways that I've shifted my thinking a bit is during the process of this project is towards more of a sort of something that fits better with that definition there. But it's not you know it's not it's about lots of things. It's about power. It's about meaning. It's about narrative. It's about justice. It's about you know understanding as well. I suppose. There's room for lots of different emphases. I think the, the slightly problematic nature of understanding is that it can come across as this is something special that the professionals do to help these people to kind of sort their problems out because they don't know how to do it themselves. I, I wouldn't want that to, to come across, and certainly that's not the intended message of the framework, which is very much about sharing ideas so that we can all you know, create our own stories and narratives if we want to, free from any kind of professional input, if possible. That's the ideal, isn't it, in a way? Should we just give Lucy a big applause? Thank you for listening and thank you for your question.